Ayadero. <laughs> All right. Welcome to the session, Designing Courses with Intention. Universal design benefits everyone. If you're joining us just now, please note that remote attendees can put their questions in the Q&A panel, pane, yeah, not in the chat pane. The chat pane is not being moderated. So if you have questions, put them in Q&A so that we can address them. Um, for attendees here in the room, Please hold your questions until the end of the session. Please feel free to get up any time to get refreshments because we don't want them to go to waste. Uh, we'll try to get as many questions as possible at the end of each session. If we don't get to them, some presenters will be here or online from 5 to 5.30, or they'll try to answer questions individually in the next few days. This presentation will encourage instructors to rethink their course design and policies to use universal design for learning to allow all students opportunities to be successful in their learning endeavors. Please give a warm welcome to our speakers, Dr. Krista Pirohito and Dr. Sarah Bomarsic. All right, thank you everyone for being here today. I feel so lucky to come right after the student panel because they just like provided all of the evidence for what I'm gonna share with you today. Um, I'm gonna uncover here for a minute what I'm about to share with you. I have a little bit of PTSD from my experiences with my children and that prevented me from optimally uh, preparing today. So I'm gonna refer to my notes a little bit. Um, so you'll see why here in, in just a second, but um, I'm gonna share a story with you. So next slide, please. Um, I, okay, so um, I became a mother when my first child, Eli, was born 16 weeks early in 2012. My third kiddo, Cooper, was also born 16 weeks early for different reasons. As they've grown, we've learned that they each have inherited disabilities that are compounded by their prematurity. Before becoming their mom, I hadn't given much consideration to accessibility outside of providing accommodations when students were registered with sales. But as I fought and advocated for accessibility and inclusion for my own children in their learning environments, it became more aware, I became more aware of the unintentional barriers that I was creating for some of my students. Given that I teach very large online classes, this meant that I had the potential to create change for a large volume of students, over 2,500 students a year. Next slide, please. It was around this time that I also became a treasure hunter through our Center for Advanced Study and Practice of Hope and the Kids at Hope organization. I noticed the parallels between the hope philosophy and presuming competency of individuals with disabilities and intentionally shifted my focus in teaching and assessment to thinking about students' strengths and talents, becoming less rigid in my views of what it meant to demonstrate competency. In doing so, I was able to find additional ways to allow students to demonstrate their competencies in my courses. I firmly believe that all of our students are capable of success, no exceptions. Realizing that how we define success is an important consideration here. We all have different goals in life, as well as different metrics for success. Our intersectional identities impact our capacities to do things as well. The way I view my role as, an, as a professor has changed. It's more than just instruction. It is to make sure that I provide them with an accessible learning environment and materials, create interest in the topics, and varied ways to demonstrate their competencies. My role is also to increase, sorry, not increase, decrease barriers to success. That's an important distinction. Next slide. I believe that everyone deserves the opportunity to be successful in their learning endeavors, and we are all here to support all students in their learning endeavors. The research on inclusive learning shows that universal design for learning strategies help all students engage in optimal learning. This supports the ASU charter and our ability to include all learners. Next slide, please. So all of these things have caused me to deeply listen to my students and reflect on my teaching practices. Through these efforts, I realized that I was not fully embracing the, and utilizing universal design for learning in my courses. Next slide, please. 
Individuals may have impairments in their auditory, visual, cognitive, or even emotional abilities that prevent them from engaging in educational opportunities in the same way as other students. Universities like ASU, as we heard earlier, receive public funds that are required, uh, that require them uh, to provide accommodations for individuals with disabilities. Some students benefit from materials presented visually, written videos with closed captioning, others from having the material presented to them auditorily, i.e. screen readers, podcasts, videos, or extended time on assessments. Sales is there to make sure that the IDEA is upheld and students are provided accommodations required by law, but as we heard, there are many students, uh, there are barriers, and there are many students that benefit from these accommodations that aren't able to register with sales. Think about it. It is a privilege to be able to afford both time and money uh, to seek out a doctor that can work with you to determine a diagnosis and spectrum of supports that you may benefit from. It's also important to consider cultural differences in the acceptability of medical diagnoses and the regional availability of qualified providers. Not everyone has access to these things. This became apparent in my conversations with so many of my students. I realized that I had a lot of students that would benefit from these supports, and frankly, it was easier to create the course with those supports embedded in the design than it was to modify my course when students needed those accommodations. The feedback I got from my students as I did this was overwhelmingly positive. The vast majority of my students reported doing better and engaging more in the content because of the design principles I was implementing. A parent comforting a sick child at bedtime could listen to their textbook and an athlete or commuter on a congested bus could read the closed captions on a lecture when they'd forgotten their headphones. It was better for everyone. When courses are built with the margins in mind, everyone benefits. <sighs> Next slide, please. So what is universal design for learning? UDL is an evidence-based framework to improve and optimize teaching and learning for all people. At the core of the framework is the belief that learners are variable. What works for one may not work for the entire class. Next slide, please. I have found that the literature talks a lot about brain-based research when we talk about learning with infants and toddlers, but we don't so much talk about it when we're talking about adult learners. So I wanted this visual up here so you guys could remember that we're still dealing with the brain when we're adult learners. <laughs> um, it's an important consideration. Um, when we talk about universal design for learning and their principles, it is important to consider the why, the what, and the how of learning. We utilize the entire brain in the learning process um, or in other items, engage in other terms, sorry. Engagement is interest and motivation. It's your affective network. Representation is content presented in a variety of ways. And action and expression is a variety of ways to demonstrate competency. So next slide. So the first component of UDL is, the, is motivation and interest. I could talk about this for an entire day for you guys because this is my dissertation area, but I'm going to keep it short. <laughs> um, by answering questions like why we need or want to learn something or why the content is important to us, um, we activate the effective networks. This helps students to create personal meaning and value for something. If we can get students to understand or create endogenous instrumentality, for what they are learning, the likelihood of them using optimal knowledge building strategies and skills and engaging in the content increases. They are more likely to connect what they are learning with their prior knowledge, which will create long-term storage of the content. Instructors can tell students that something is important, but the even more powerful is when students construct their own why. Provide them examples of how and why the information may be important, then ask them to reflect on why it's important to them. Making this apparent in application assignments and the way quiz questions are worded um, is also important. Another way to increase motivation is to allow choice in some assignments or assignment components. This may look like letting students choose from a pre-selected menu of topics or allowing them to select their own topic entirely, of course, that it's related to the content. Lastly, ensuring that content in your course is inclusive and not exclusive will increase the interest of all students. Check to make sure that the images and language you use in your course are inclusive and your sources and narratives from diverse authors. Imagine sitting in a science course and only being shown images of white, able-bodied male scientists or in a family diversity course, 
but all of the images in the book and on the lectures are of white, able-bodied, heterosexual, middle-class families. It happens. And if you look at your course material and you haven't looked through it through that lens before, you might be surprised. Lack of representation decreases motivation and engagement. Okay, next slide, please. The second component of universal design for learning is uh, presenting information in multiple organized and accessible formats. So presenting information in multiple formats activa activates recognition networks. Providing lectures, podcasts, and written information allows students to access information in multiple ways. But it also creates repetition, which is super important for learning. Closed captioning videos ensures that they are accessible to anyone that cannot access audio when they are, when they are ready to learn. Alt text for images for those that cannot see the images. Transcripts for those that are unable to access videos. PDFs that are screen reader accessible, et cetera. An important note about textbooks that was hit upon earlier by students um, is to make sure that as we move to textbooks um, that are digital access only, that selecting one that is WCAG compliant so that, accessible, so that it is accessible is important. I've learned the very hard way not to trust the textbook reps when they tell me that it is accessible because a lot of them are not. Next slide. A quick note here that universal design is not learning styles. <laughs> I have to say that. Um, there is a difference between universal design for learning and learning styles. Um, you may have heard of the research on learning styles. Um, it's a kinesthetic, auditory, visual. Um, learning styles have largely been debunked um, by many, many studies over the past decade. Um, at best, most non-disabled people have learning preferences, um, but these preferences have little impact on learning outcomes. Um, providing information in multiple modalities is optimal, though, um, for learning for most people. Again, this is different for people with disabilities, which is why it's important to make sure that all of your content is accessible. Next slide. The third component is to differentiate how students demonstrate competencies. Um, so let's um, talk about providing varied ways uh, for students to demonstrate their competencies. Um, demonstrating that learning occurs involves the strategic network of the brain, most commonly known as executive functioning. It requires metacognition and planning, providing opportunities for students to show that they have learned the content and are able to apply it in any course is important, but equally important is that the assignments are varied. A course that utilizes only multiple choice exams or essays isn't allowing all students to demonstrate their competencies. Um, we want our students to be out of the box thinkers, so we should encourage, encourage this in the assignments we create for them. Um, examples include uh, creating discussion prompts that don't have an answer and allows choice and critical thinking. Um, allow students to write or record audio or video for responses um, allows choice in format. Creative outreach projects in which the student gets to select the topic and how they execute their project increases interest and autonomy and allows students to select a project that aligns with their strengths and the course content. Also asking students to reflect and, on and share what they learned, how they will use that information, and how it's important to them at the end of the course creates retention. Um, encourage iterative work that is mastery oriented and allows students to incorporate feedback and monitor their progress. Next slide, please. As you are designing your courses and setting course policies, please think about the following. Are your course policies helpful or harmful to students? What can you do to be more supportive? Read through your course policies and ask yourself, why do I have this rule? Is it to benefit me or the students? Can I be more flexible? With the incorporation of technology into our courses, are timed assessments really necessary? Is there an opportunity to provide grace or flexible deadlines to all students via a life happens pass? Put thought into the types of assignments you create, the deadlines that you give, and how content is created and shared using universal design for learning principles. Last slide. Before I transition over to Sarah, I'd like to remind everyone that communication is important. Goodwill goes a long way if you muck something up, and it lets students know that you care. Asking all students what barriers they perceive to be in their way at the beginning of each class is also a good way to start the conversation and think of ways you can make your course more accessible and engaging for everyone. 
I will be back to share some resources with you when Sarah is done. Hi, I'm Sarah Bomarsic. I teach in the School of International Letters and Cultures. And first of all, I want to thank Krista for inviting me to be part of this. Uh, when we uh, talked about uh, that, we decided that my experience was best for talking about how to talk to students with disabilities about what they need in the course. Uh, the reason for that is that uh, I come from a family where at least six generations back, children are born hard of hearing, which eventually progresses to deafness. Uh, so uh, I've been dealing with this as a student as well as a faculty member at ASU. So my hearing loss kicked in around age four, and I'm now at that point where I'm almost entirely deaf. Um, I was mainstreamed, so this was just customary. In my family, we regarded ourselves more as part of the hearing world than of the deaf world, which is fairly typical for the hard of hearing. So I've had a lot of experiences with this. I went to college just as after the ADA had been passed. So it was about a year old at that point. And I think this is back like a lot of colleges, Smith didn't really know what it was doing at that point yet. There, so there were a number of uncomfortable conversations with professors, things like, why do you need this? And this is the kind of con communication style I am advocating that you not engage in with students. Um, generally speaking, um, what, uh, what I would recommend is a couple things. I want to start broadly uh, with a broad list of things to avoid and then turn to what's positive, what you can do. Uh, the first is, is, is that I would encourage you to avoid several myths about students or colleagues with disabilities. And since most of you are here, you probably already are aware of the pitfalls. But be aware of falling into a thought pattern that disability is the same as inability, because it's not. Uh, as Krista demonstrated, there's always a path around it. Uh, the second uh, myth, and I think this is a much harder trap to avoid if you think about disability a lot, is don't fall into the heroic myth of the disabled student or the disabled in individual. Don't turn them into inspiration porn, in other words. Okay? And then the third one is don't fall into uh, the trap of thinking that accommodations are unfair or they don't level or, or that they give the student with a disability a disadvantage. They are intended to kind of level the playing ground, but in truth, they never actually do. I am not going to hear as well as hearing people well. Um, what it is is it's just kind of working your way around the playing field in a different uh, manner. Okay. So I would avoid, so I just avoid trying to, it, we all fall into these traps. I fall into these traps, particularly when I'm dealing with other disabilities. So just sort of uh, keep that in mind uh, when you're talking to students. But what I found most useful in talking to students with disabilities a lot of it is what Krista said towards the end. Uh, ask them what the barriers are. But uh, so what I would advocate is uh, three things. Communicate with them. If you get a memo from sales, usually what I do is I'll follow up with the counselor if there are any questions that I have about implementing accommodations, especially things I don't know how to do myself. Uh, like, for instance, I didn't know how to give extra time in Canvas uh, for tests when we first started Canvas a couple years ago. Um, but also communicate with the students. Let them know that you received the memo. Don't get into any personal information or anything like that. Just let them know you received the memo, um, the accommodations have been or will be implemented, uh, and they are free to reach out to you if they want to talk about anything further. Most of them don't. Most of them say thank you and move on. But sometimes they do follow up. Sometimes they come back and say, I'm struggling with this. Uh, this would help. Can we try this? Uh, sometimes that requires a conversation with their sales counselor, but often it's just something I can do on my own. For instance, one student told me that it would be helpful to her, this is an online large course, told me it would be helpful to her to see the discussion prompt for the next module so that she had more time to think about it. 
And I thought about that, and that didn't seem unreasonable to me. So I would send her that question a couple days ahead of time before the module opened. Also communicate with them if there's any sort of problem. Uh, so I did this yesterday. There was a quiz I had forgot, I'd forgotten to do extra time on for a student. Uh, so I wrote, she'd already taken it. I wrote her and apologized and said, here's another attempt, totally my fault. Uh, let me know if you see a quiz that doesn't have the right time on Canvas. So I would, just, so I would say open, positive communication, avoiding, of course, any discussion of diagnosis, any sort of prejudgment. Just be open, be also calm, um, and know what, understand what your course, you understand what your course is about. Uh, you know, you are actually the one who knows how best the student would fit into your course. The student is the expert on their disability. Uh, they are the ones who know what they can do in your course. So ideally a conversation uh, between you and a student with a disability or anyone with a disability would, uh, would um, intersect along those points. And I think that's all I have. Right, next, next slide, please. Um, so here I have some resources to share. Um, the Sanford Schools Hope uh, uh, Center, um, UDL guidelines on CAST. Um, UDL on campus is for college students uh, specifically. And then uh, the Digital Promise as well. And these should be available in the slides that are on the website. And then on the next slide is the references for all of the content that I've uh, referenced in my slides. And then the last slide is, of course, the formatting. Um, slides Go has, has a ton of uh, accessible um, representative content. So thank you for your time. Uh, we're going to look at questions now. So does anyone have questions? Thank you, Terry. <laughs> Thank you very much for that presentation. I really appreciate it. I was kind of curious about how um, things might be different when you're approaching um, either undergrad or grad students who are doing research. Um, a lot of this is about the classroom, but I was just kind of curious how things might go differently or um, accommodations might be different for research. Um, I will be 100% honest here and tell you that I mostly work with undergraduate students now. I used to teach graduate classes. Um, I ask the student what they need and I meet them with the, at their needs is really what I do. Um, I, I don't require students to have sales accommodations anymore. If they tell me they need something, if they tell me there's barriers, I, wor I work with them to solve it. It really is that just for me that simple. Um, yeah. Did you want have anything to add on that one, Sarah? Terry has a question. Thanks. I do have a question. First of all, I just want to say thank you. This is a tremendous opportunity, and we're so glad to be able to be here. Um, one question I have about what you were presenting is, in our syllabus, we're required to put so many of the ASU policies in there. There's a policy for late work and there's a policy for excused absences and all those kinds of things. Would, would it be all right if we drew a box around those and say, this ASU requires this to be in our syllabus, however, come talk to us if you, if, for any reason, come talk to us. We're flexible with, in real life, we're flexible, but we have to say these things in our syllabus. Is that, is there, are there, like, is there a bridge of language for that? Yeah, so I think ASU requires us to have a late policy. They don't dictate what it is, right? So you can say, I have flexible deadlines. I teach large online classes. I have 300 students in my class. The volume of emails that I get is overwhelming. So I created a Google form for my students to fill out. If you have a life happens pass or you have an accommodation, you have an emergency, fill out the form. It's not meant to be uh, a, a negative uh, 
with a negative connotation. I can't find the word I'm looking for here. Um, but it allows me to go back and make sure that I actually find their work and grade it because Canvas is not great at always showing up things the second time they submit it or if it's past the deadline or it's a discussion or whatever. So I think, yes, we have to have ASU policies in our, in our syllabus, but, but having a late work policy, you get to define what the late work is. You get to define what your attendance policy is. And then, of course, telling the students that please come talk to me if there are problems and communicating that in either videos or announcements or emails or um, mid-session check-ins, right? Hey, I noticed you're struggling. You're missing assignments. How can I help you? Um, how you communicate with students matters. Thank yeah. you. Mm -hmm. All right. There is one online question really quick. I'll uh, read it really quick. It says, does ASU offer resources to help instructors provide the different mediums of information? Or even more important, does ASU offer resources to help instructors to make their courses more accessible? If so, what are there? If not, what is needed and how do we get it to empower our instructors in supporting their students? Um, so yes, we have resources. <laughs> um, this whole conference was created by a work, working group. Um, we're just a bunch of, I say nomads from across campus um, that come together and meet and, and work to help provide supports. So if you go to accessibility.asu.edu, you will find probably more information than you can digest about how to make your content accessible. Um, Mary Loader uh, from Ed Plus, uh, Ed Plus, right? Uh, we'll also be presenting later today about an accessible course creator, which is a, a course in Canvas that she has created to teach students how to um, create um, accessible courses. So teach faculty how to do those things. Um, so yes, we have, we have resources. They are there. They are um, faculty and staff driven. Um, they've all been created by us wanting to make things more accessible. So that's my plug. I do believe we are at time. Uh, so I am going to uh, uh, thank everyone for listening to us ramble. <laughs> I hope it was useful. Um, and Adero, thank you. Thank you again, Dr. Spurahito and Bomarsish. Uh, your candidness and willingness to share your personal stories is also a benefit to all of us. Thank you. Uh, we'll begin the next session, accessible listening, inclusive uses of sound in the classroom in just a few minutes, about two minutes to be precise. Please join us here again in the Gold Room on campus or virtually in the conference room. It's the same Zoom room for the entire conference. Thank you, everyone. We'll begin in just a few moments.